Hello, my name is Danaya Zaria and I'm the convener of International Energy Law. In the following minutes I will be taking you through the course. Um, the module International Energy Law uh, deals with the manner in which international, public international law um, governs issues relating to energy act activities onshore and offshore. The course uh, covers oil, gas, electricity and renewables and it looks at uh, a number of activities in the energy sector such as exploration, exploitation, transportation and trade. This course will be dealing with a number of fascinating topics. For instance, whether Ukraine violated in 2009 its uh, international obligations when it interrupted transit of energy uh, via pipeline which carried gas um, from Russia and destined to the European states uh, is a, a question, an example of a question that this course seeks to answer. Um, the rights of foreign investors and the um, obligations of states, especially in the context of uh, the recurring nationalizations, for example in South America in recent years, is another topic that this course will be dealing with. Nigeria's uh, conduct um, when it permitted um, the um, exploitation of natural resources in Ogoniland and the effects of these um, investments on uh, local population has brought um, a number of claims against Nigeria uh, before uh, the ECOWAS court as well as the uh, African Commission on uh, Human Rights for a violation of the African Charter of Human Rights and also uh, it has brought it has uh, brought about a number of claims by um, individuals against these uh, foreign investors. The most recent example of such a case is the Kyobel case before the United States Supreme Court in 2013. Another example is the attempt by Greenpeace to board the platform of Gazprom in the Barents Sea last year and the seizure by Russia of the vessel of Greenpeace. This um, incident led to a dispute between the Netherlands and Russia uh, before um, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea and it raises a number of issues including a uh, question of state jurisdiction in maritime areas as well as energy security issues. Now all these issues uh, will be discussed in the course and in fact they will uh, form part of um, um, different seminars as case studies. Traditionally, uh, students that take the course uh, have either a background in public international law they have either practiced uh, the law of international, the international law of uh, natural resources, or um, they they have developed such an interest in um, after uh, some years of studies in public international law, or um, there are students that have uh, practiced in different areas of domestic law, such as energy law or commercial law. We have also had students that have uh, worked for governments, for instance, in ministries of foreign affairs. <clears throat> ministries of Economy uh, or uh, Ministries of Energy and the Environment. And finally we have had students that have uh, worked as officials in international organizations, um, including for instance financial institutions which have supported energy projects around the world. Of course none of these um, backgrounds are essential for a student to take the course, but some of these careers might be the careers that uh, the students uh, that take the course aspire to. And now a few words about the potential combinations with other courses on the LLM. I think that this course would go ideally together with um, most of the courses on the uh, LLM specialization in international law or um, the specialization in environmental law and the specialization in uh, energy law. I would encourage my students to take uh, also international environmental law the law of international courts and tribunals, of course the law of treaties given that um, most of the rules of international law that we will be looking at in international energy law are based on treaties and also the law of international investment. For those of you that have not been taught uh, public international law before, um, it, you could possibly combine this course with the foundations and principles of international law. Of course that is uh, not absolutely mandatory given that we will be giving a platform uh, to you in the first five lectures of uh, the course uh, with the main uh, concepts of international law. But I think that the course on foundations and principles could uh, very well combine with this course as well. Another interesting combination would be that with in the regional aspects of international energy law. Uh, that course covers 
EU uh, energy law as uh, and the EU as an actor in international energy law. So it first of all uh, looks at um, primary and secondary EU uh, rules concerning uh, energy, and then most importantly, it focuses on the influence that the EU may um, uh, have in shaping rules of international energy law, such as in relation to investment, trade, the environment, the law of the sea. And of course, it looks at the interaction of the EU with third states and other international organizations in the energy sector. Uh, there is no textbook for this course, for the mere reason that there is no um, textbook in international energy law as yet. This is an emerging area of international law. The reading lists uh, include book chapters, as well as um, articles from academic journals. Um, the reading lists are structured with essential reading and further reading. This is intended to assist students to prepare for um, the classes and for their exams. And uh, at the end of every reading list, we have included a, a number of uh, questions for discussions. They, students are expected uh, to prepare these uh, questions uh, before coming to class, and then we will have a discussion in class. In recent years, this class has been very popular, so we have approximately 40 students. However, I do not teach the class on the basis of lectures, rather uh, we have seminars and um, students are expected to come prepared in class for discussion. To ensure that um, students effectively learn and that they um, benefit and take a number of skills throughout the whole class, different learning techniques are employed. And more particularly, we will have uh, very often group uh, discussions in class. We will also have uh, presentations by a number of you uh, of uh, case law, especially in relation to investment protection. Um, and you will be receiving feedback in the uh, form of discussion in class. Um, there will also be a mo moot um, roundtable of NGOs, um, investors and states in relation to a cross, an actual cross-border pipeline in the Caspian region. And finally, we will simulate a disruption of supply situation and the potential responses by the International Energy Agency. The course consists of four uh, parts. Part one gives a platform to the students so that they are able to uh, follow the specificities of international energy law. So effectively, we will be looking at the fundamental concepts of public international law that you need for the purposes of international energy law. Uh, we will be looking at the definition of international energy law as a discipline, the definition of energy for the purposes of our course, the definition of energy activities for the purposes of the course as well. Then we will be looking at the sources of international energy law, the key actors of international energy law, some basic concepts and the relationship between these concepts, so for instance, permanent sovereignty over natural resources and its relationship to sustainable development. And then we will be looking at uh, state jurisdiction, international responsibility of uh, states and international organizations, as well as international dispute settlement and international enforcement of rules uh, of international energy law. We will begin with the protection of foreign investment in the energy sector. Um, we will look at uh, rules of customer international law, as well as bilateral investment treaties and multilateral treaties that contain provisions for the protection, uh, protection of foreign investors. For example, the Energy Charter Treaty. In, in fact, we will focus on the Energy Charter Treaty. A number of arbitral awards have been issued under the Energy Charter Treaty, um, including, for example, the Yukos case, which uh, involved a question about the provisional application of that treaty. And of course, it represented the biggest investor claim uh, of its time. In this seminar, a number of you will be presenting some case law from the 70s and uh, that pertain to the nationalizations by Libya of um, foreign investments in the energy sector. Then the Energy Charter Treaty will be examined in detail. We will not only look at the investment protection provisions of that treaty, but importantly, we will focus on the provisions on trade, transit, the environment and competition. And this will give us a bridge to the uh, next seminar on the uh, World Trade Organization and energy issues.
In recent years, in fact, a number of cases have been brought before the dispute settlement understanding of the WTO, which signals the um, uh, increasing importance of energy in the um, WTO. And we will be looking at um, renewables, uh, oil and gas, and um, in the context of imports, exports and subsidies rules. Now, having examined the rules on trade and the protection of investors, the course then looks at the um, manner in which international law deals with energy activities during armed conflict. So we will be looking at, first of all, the um, law of, on the use of force and uh, then international humanitarian law and effectively whether international humanitarian law allows and under which conditions the targeting of um, energy infrastructure. We will also be looking at the law of occupation and with the question of whether the occupying power can exploit the natural resources in the occupied territory these are very important issues that have arisen in the context of the occupation in Iraq in 2000, after 2003, and um, in uh, Cyprus as well as more, more recently uh, with South Ossetia. This seminar will also look at uh, whether um, the treaties on um, the protection of foreign investors and treaties on trade remain in force and are applicable during armed conflict. Part 3 deals with the manner in which public international law regulates the development and exploitation of oil, gas and renewables, offshore and onshore. And it deals also with the issue of transportation of these uh, sources in a cross-border manner. As far as exploitation activities are concerned, our focus will be um, the maritime areas where states exercise jurisdiction. But because in given years there has been an increasing interest in the exploitation of minerals in the area, we will also be looking at um, the exploitation of resources beyond in, air, in maritime areas beyond national jurisdiction. This part will also deal with um, the manner in which international law governs transboundary uh, projects as such. An example that we will explore is the Nord Stream pipeline uh, in the Baltic Sea. And we will also look at um, projects that, although they are not transboundary themselves, they do um, have a transboundary harm or a transboundary effect beyond the jurisdiction of the state where they are located. Finally, part four touches on the interplay between different actors and different interests, such as human rights issues and environmental concerns in the energy sector. Here, the focus will be customary rules and treaty rules for the protection of the environment and the manner in which um, individuals could possibly comp complain for a violation of these rules against states. We will examine in detail the Aarhus Convention, the ESPO Convention, the Kiev Protocol, as well as the OSPAR Convention, and we will explore whether uh, individuals could bring claims against states uh, for a compliance uh, for their compliance with these treaties. A separate seminar will deal with human rights and the energy sector and more particularly we will look at different regional uh, human rights treaties, the African Charter on Human Rights, the American uh, Convention on Human Rights will be examined as well as the case law of the African Commission and the ECOWAS Court uh, and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We will look at in detail the effect of the exploitation of natural resources on human rights, both of indig indigenous peoples and of uh, individuals. The two final seminars deal with issues of accountability. Accountability of corporations and accountability of um, international financial institutions. The issue of accountability of uh, corporations is particularly important in recent years given that the United Nations has adopted guidelines on business and human rights uh, and the issue of um, accountability of financial institutions um, has to do with, for instance, the World Bank or the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The two last um, seminars in this part deal with accountability. Accountability of uh, corporations and accountability of financial, international financial institutions. The 
issue of institutional accountability will be looked at through the case study of the World Bank and the questions there will relate to the manner in which financial institutions have um, tried to ensure um, that they are held themselves accountable in cases that they have not ensured that their own standards for the protection of the environment and the protection of human rights have not been complied with in the projects that they finance. Finally, the uh, last uh, um, class, uh, substantive class for the year, will deal with energy security in international law. We will deal with piracy and hijacking of um, tankers, boarding of offshore platforms and transit passage through uh, straits. We will also look at the security of supply scheme of the International Energy Agency through a simulation. This will allow us to contrast the narrow definition of energy security that is um, restricted to um, the, the, the questions of uh, security of supply uh, to wider definitions of energy security that have um, become more pertinent in recent years and include also concerns uh, about the environment, the protection of the environment, the protection of human rights, protection of investments, as well as the stability of cross-border trade. And um, this particular class will give us a very good bridge for the revision class at the end of our course. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in class next year.